Welcome to Cinematic Excrement and my never-ending quest to yada yada yada. Last time we looked at Paul Verhoeven's fantastic misfire, Showgirls, and somehow the following year's worst picture winner was also a movie about strippers. The 90s were weird. Released in 1996 and based on the novel of the same name by Carl Hyacin, Strip T stars Demi Moore, no relation, as Erin Grant, who recently lost her job and custody of her daughter due to her ex-husband's incompetence. Having hit rock bottom, she becomes a stripper with the hopes of eventually earning enough money to file an appeal and get her daughter back. Despite the risque nature of the plot, which the marketing department took full advantage of, the ingredients of a good movie were there. It was written and directed by Andrew Bergman, who co-wrote Blazing Saddles, was based on a New York Times bestseller, and had a decent cast, including Armand Asante, Ving Rhames, Robert Patrick, Burt Reynolds, and the aforementioned more. But in this case, the whole was less than the sum of its parts. It opened to dismal reviews and only made $33 million at the American box office against a $50 million budget, though its worldwide gross was $113 million. So it didn't exactly bomb, but it didn't exactly do as well as the studio was hoping either. I had actually never seen the movie before watching it for this review, so I wasn't really sure what to expect. I was hoping for more of the silliness of Showgirls, but what I ended up with was kind of the opposite of Showgirls in a way. Showgirls was supposed to be a serious dramatic film, and everyone in the cast was at least attempting to portray it that way, except one, Gina Gershon. She knew exactly what kind of movie she was in, and she hammed it up to 11, and she seemed to be the only one who was having any fun. Striptease, however, is not an unintentional comedy like Showgirls. It's a comedy by design, much like the book it was based on. Whether it succeeded in that regard, well, we'll get to that. But it was actually supposed to be a very silly movie, and everyone in the cast is acting like they are in a very silly movie, except one. And unfortunately, that one is the star. Demi Moore is playing her part completely straight, as if she were in a serious dramatic film. And boy howdy does her performance clash with, well, everything. Did no one tell her striptease was supposed to be a comedy, or does she just not understand how comedy works? I can understand if it's not exactly her forte. She's only done a handful of comedic films throughout her career. But that does raise the question, why would they cast her in this film knowing full well she'd be out of her element? Well, according to Bergman, the answer is quite simple. She was the only big name they could get for the lead. Or at least she was the only one willing to get naked. Or almost naked. And Bergman wasn't going to do the movie without nudity. I mean, it is a movie about strippers, what are you gonna do? And for agreeing to take it all off for striptease, Demi Moore was paid $12.5 million, a record for an actress at the time and about a quarter of the movie's budget. The current record-holding actress, if you're curious, is Sandra Bullock, who was paid $20 million up front for Gravity, but also earned a portion of the movie's revenue, so her actual take-home was about $70 million. This has been another useless fact. Anyway, the nudity and striptease didn't approach the level of Showgirls, so there was no danger of an NC-17 rating, and no one had to lick any unsanitized surfaces or bounce up and down on Kyle McLaughlin's belly button. But if you were playing a stripper in this movie, it was a safe bet your titties were coming out at some point. That included Miss Moore herself, several of her castmates, some of whom were strippers in real life, so this was nothing new for them. And wait a minute, that's Rena Riffle! She played Penny in Showgirls! And one year later, in her next big screen role, she is once again playing a stripper. Man, talk about getting typecast. Well, let's take a quick look at the story. As I mentioned earlier, Moore's character Erin used to work as an FBI secretary until they fired her when her drug-addicted husband Daryl, played by Robert Patrick, got arrested for selling, of all things, stolen wheelchairs. Apparently, being married to a druggie and a criminal is the kind of thing the FBI frowns upon. Who knew? And sadly, I find it totally believable that she would have to suffer for the sins of her ex-husband, despite the fact that she herself did nothing wrong, apart from having terrible taste in men. It's what comes next that I have trouble swallowing. The custody hearing does not go well, as she's now unemployed, and the judge apparently has fond memories of Daryl as a high school football player. So despite being a drug-addicted criminal, he gets custody, and all she gets is bi-weekly visitation with her daughter Angela, played by Moore's real-life daughter, Rumor Willis. I know this is supposed to be a very silly movie, but the idea that the judge would grant Daryl sole custody of his daughter just because he thought he was a good football player in high school seems like a bit much. 
even in the worst of good old boy counties. I'm also not clear on how her husband can apparently afford a lawyer and she can't, or why she became a stripper in the first place. Normally, FBI to adult entertainment is not a typical career path. There's nothing wrong with being a stripper, mind you, we all gotta pay the bills somehow, but it's not very clear how she got to that point. This plays out a bit differently in the book where Erin did in fact have an attorney and in fact she became a stripper in the first place to pay his fees because she needed money now and it paid better than clerical work. But somehow Daryl found out about her new profession and invited the judge to one of her shows. And the judge, being a good Christian man, was shocked and appalled and awarded custody to Daryl in order to teach Erin a lesson about morality. And of course, this good Christian man then became a regular at the club Aaron danced at because people like him only have morals when it allows them to subjugate others. Now, this story I can buy. It's still a bit silly, but not to the point where I cannot suspend my disbelief. I can't say the same for the movie. I also don't understand how those two ended up together in the first place, let alone stayed together long enough to have a child. The book at least gives us a brief explanation. Basically, Aaron's mother, played by Dame not appearing in this film, kept trying to fix her up with doctors, lawyers, and whatnot, and eventually she got sick of it. Then she met Daryl and he charmed the hell out of her. By lying his ass off. And she bought it, at first. A few months after they married, he started to show his true colors and she learned he was an addict and a thief. But then Angela was born and he promised to change his ways. And he did. For about a month. But then he went right back to the pills and the crime and she filed for divorce and that's how we ended up here. And you would think at least an abbreviated version of that story would have ended up in the movie, but no. Unless they filmed it and it later ended up on the cutting room floor, I know they made some changes to the film after the first round of test screenings didn't go well, so who knows. As Aaron's story plays out, we're introduced to three more major characters. First, we have David Dilbeck, played with no subtlety whatsoever by Burt Reynolds. Dilbeck is essentially a satire of a Republican congressman, as evidenced by his autographed photo of Newt Gingrich, good lord. And while he and his handlers certainly like to portray him as a hero of the religious right and family values and whatnot, he is of course a total horn dog who spends most of his free time visiting strip clubs incognito and covering himself in Vaseline while wearing a cowboy hat and boots, leather vest, and boxers. I'm sure somebody thought this was funny, but... Personally, I'm way too confused to laugh. And yes, he's sniffing a handful of dryer lint. We'll come back to that, and I apologize in advance. Reynolds was not the filmmaker's first choice, Gene Hackman turned them down, but he actively campaigned for the part as he was very familiar with the types of people Dilbeck was based on. He met a lot of them in his youth when his father was a police chief. He was even willing to take a pay cut to play Dilbeck. And while the comedic aspects of his character don't always hit, seriously, what the f*** is this? I do think Reynolds nailed the intent behind this character and the blatant hypocrisy that is sadly quite prevalent in so many politicians. And he clearly had a ball making this movie. There was not one scrap of scenery that went unchewed. Oddly enough, Dilbeck was a Democrat in the book, and I honestly don't know why they bothered to change it. I could understand if the movie were made today. The GOP are the obvious villains right now, but the Dems are plenty capable of being lecherous scumbags. I mean, who was president in 96? Yeah, I rust my case. Moving right along, we have Shad, played by Ving Rhames, the lovable bouncer at the Eager Beaver. And yes, that's really the name of the club. And they took that straight from the book, so I can't say they didn't stay true to the source material. Shad is easily my favorite character in the movie. He's probably the only character that is consistently funny. Is that a roach? No, it's a fucking shrimp. Now move, you're in my life. The first time we see him, he's trying to scam a yogurt company by planting a cockroach in a yogurt cup so he can claim he found it there and was traumatized by it or some such bullshit. And he's working on this scheme with a lawyer who apparently operates out of an office behind a video store. And shockingly, his name is not Saul Goodman. And speaking of the video store, Shad gets very upset when he finds out the copy of Free Willy he put on hold still has not been returned. People of pigs sit on movies like they own them. Oh, I pity the poor sap that held on to that copy of Free Willy past its due date. And we have Police Lieutenant Al Garcia, played by Armand Asante. He takes an interest in Aaron after he, by chance, finds the body of one of Aaron's regular customers floating in the river. Apparently, this guy decided to blackmail Congressman Dilbeck with some photos of him in the eager beaver so Dilbeck would help influence the judge in Aaron's custody case. And that's literally all he asks for. He just wants to help a woman in need and expects nothing in return. Imagine that. 
an actual, honest-to-God, decent man. So, of course, he had to die. And since his bloated corpse practically floated up to Garcia's doorstep, he takes a personal interest in the case. Of all the lakes, in all the counties, in all the world, you gotta float up in mine. A Casablanca reference? While he's fishing a body out of a river? Really? Garcia is honestly my least favorite character in the movie. I don't have a problem with Asante's performance or anything, he was fine, but the character doesn't really serve much of a purpose. He's always there, but he doesn't actually do anything. Hell, there's even a scene where he explains that he can't do anything after Daryl threatens Aaron with a knife. The fact is, he threatened and he did not actually attempt. So because he threatened to kill her but didn't actually try to do so, your hands are tied. I see the police were just as useless in 1996 as they are today. Thankfully, Shad is not the police. He's a guy who actually gets shit done and breaks bones. Did I mention I like Shad? Because I do. Getting back to the plot, Erin finally decides she's had enough of Daryl's bullshit and just straight up kidnaps her daughter. I know that's a weird way of putting it, but from a purely legal standpoint, that is essentially what she's doing. And somehow, she gets away with this. I'm honestly surprised Daryl doesn't just call the cops. Don't get me wrong, he's an asshole and I enjoyed watching Chad hurt him, and Angela is obviously better off with Aaron. But he has legal custody of Angela and he'd be well within his rights to call the cops, who obviously know where Aaron lives, but it never occurs to him to do so. But then, he is very stupid. It's a wonder he's gotten this far in life despite not having two brain cells to rub together. Then again, considering the world we live in, I'm surprised he's not president. This is another situation where they made a change from the book that just made the story more confusing. In the book, Erin not only found a new apartment so Daryl couldn't easily find her again, she actually filed an appeal and got proper custody of her daughter based on the fact that Daryl left Angela with some very irresponsible family members while he was out selling his stolen wheelchairs. It's a minor detail in the grand scheme of things, but what a difference that minor detail makes. Without that detail, the cops are free to arrest Aaron and return Angela to Daryl at any time. But they don't because reasons. Well, regardless of how Aaron regained custody of Angela, it leads to some very awkward scenes where Aaron has to bring her daughter to work, which is an element of showgirls I did not expect to see repeated here. But at least Aaron's co-workers are actually decent people and they're attempting to make this a relatively wholesome environment. The other dancers in Shad are even playing board games with her. That's strangely adorable- <laughs> Hang on a second, what? What the hell did I just see? Go back to the shot of them playing the game. Okay, that's obviously Candyland. Now go to the close-up. What the... I don't even know what the f*** I'm looking at here. What is this? This is not the only time this happens in the movie. Take a look at this. So this is clearly shoots and ladders, and if we switch to the close-up... Okay, that board has neither shoots nor ladders. What the hell? Did they somehow lose the boards before they shot the close-ups? But if that were the case, why wouldn't they have just gone to Toys R Us, R.I.P., and bought another copy? Or... Was it a rights issue? But if it was a rights issue, wouldn't that also have prevented them from doing the wide shots? How is it that a movie about murder and strippers and corrupt politicians is making me so confused over a child's board game? Well, anyway, the dishonorable Congressman Dilbeck happens to visit the eager beaver one night and instantly becomes infatuated with Aaron. Can't blame him for that, but the infatuation soon turns into an obsession and he starts stalking her and paying his subordinates to stalk her on his behalf. He even resorts to having one of his goons steal some of her dryer lint from a laundromat so he can... smell it. I did warn you we'd be coming back to that dryer lint. And we're not done. Dilbeck eventually asks Aaron for a private dance in exchange for a hefty sum of money. As she's not made of stone and believes the influence of a congressman could help her get proper custody of her daughter, Aaron agrees to the dance, but Shad insists he tag along as her bodyguard because that's just the kind of guy he is. I'm Barbara Bush. Who is he? George Bush. I remember seeing that scene in the trailer and thinking, wow, this might actually be kind of funny. I was not prepared for what came next. During the private dance, Dilbeck accidentally lets loose the fact that he stole her dryer lint. And what did you do with that fresh, hot lint? I'm afraid I made love to it.
Excuse me, please. <laughs> you did what? You made love to it? How does one even... No, no, you know what? No, I don't want to know. Do not answer that. I don't want to know. Set this down very carefully. No, don't tip over. I just cleaned the carpet. There we go. <clears throat> it is remarkable how hit and miss the jokes are in this movie. I mean, even some of the jokes that come way out of left field are still funny, at least to an extent. There's a bit where the owner of the Eager Beaver, a guy named Orly, poaches a stripper from a rival club with a snake named, I kid you not, Monty Python. Unfortunately, the snake does not survive the journey from the rival club, and it's implied the owners of said club are responsible. But never fear, Orly has the solution. There's an all-night snake farm on Route 27. Ask for Jungle Juan. So Shad gets the new snake without telling the dancer, and of course it all goes horribly wrong, and not Monty ends up nearly strangling the poor girl to death. Okay, so, a lot going on here. First of all, holy trademark infringement, Batman. Monty Python? I don't know how they got away with that. Second, of course they replace the snake thinking no one will be the wiser and it all goes to shit. That's a joke as old as time, nothing special there. But then there's the 24-hour snake farm run by a guy named Jungle Juan, because Florida, and not only does this place exist, but the owner of the strip club has apparently done enough business with Jungle Juan that they're on a first-name basis. When I look at something like this that is just so completely batshit, I actually have to respect it, I do. And all the time Bergman spent working with Mel Brooks must have driven him completely mad and God bless him for it. In fact, I can respect a good portion of the comedy in this movie. But then there's the lint. And I just, I, what, I, why? And the sad thing is, I can't totally blame this one on the movie because that very line, I'm afraid I made love to it, came directly from the book. Carl Hyacin, you are bad and you should feel bad. Ultimately, things get incredibly messy when Daryl somehow tracks Aaron to Congressman Dilbeck's yacht and, being dosed up to the eyeballs on morphine, starts beating the shit out of anyone that stands in his way. What happens next is incredibly confusing, so bear with me. Somehow, Erin ends up taking her ex and the congressman for a ride at gunpoint and tries to force Daryl to sign over custody of Angela right then and there. And he's obviously completely wasted, so even if you can keep him conscious long enough to sign on the dotted line, that's not gonna hold up in court. And she somehow tricks Dilbeck into confessing, on tape, that his handlers murdered the guy we saw floating in the river earlier. And then Garcia and Shad take out said handlers, hey, Garcia finally did something, and a local news station shows up and literally catches Dilbeck with his pants down. And all of the assholes go to jail, and Aaron gets her daughter back, and I have no idea what the hell just happened, and thank god I don't care. Do that, do that. That's, this That's the movie in five seconds. And that's striptease in a nutshell. It's not very good, although it does have its moments. Shad was awesome, Reynolds got a chuckle out of me here and there, and it did mostly stay true to the book's plot. For what it's worth, Hyacin liked it, but it did get a lot of things wrong. The story was a ridiculous, confusing mess and did not do justice to Hyacin's satire. Moore's performance was woefully out of place. A lot of the jokes did not hit, and it was a very long two hours, mainly because they padded the runtime with bad jokes and dance sequences that served little purpose except to give those who rented the movie from Blockbuster, RIP, an excuse for a pause and toss. Oh my god, I'm having flashbacks to cats! I can't believe I'm saying this, but bring back Burt Reynolds covered in Vaseline. I will take that over the cat lady. The movie was nominated for seven Razzies and took home six. Bergman won Worst Screenplay and Director, Moore won Worst Actress and Screen Couple with Reynolds, The Light Crust Doughboys won Worst Original Song for Pussy Pussy Pussy, which is indeed a terrible song, but I question its inclusion here because the song was at least 50 years old when the movie came out. That doesn't really fit the spirit of an award like this. Tommy Lee's Welcome to Planet Boom would have been a much better choice. 
If you ever wanted to know what the poor man's Rob Zombie sounds like, listen to that song and you'll know. And of course it won Worst Picture, beating fellow nominees Barb Wire, Ed, The Island of Dr. Moreau, and The Stupids. There's a cesspool of mediocrity if ever I saw one. It's actually kind of hard to say if striptease definitely deserve to win Worst Picture, because all the nominated films are bad, but there really aren't any standouts. The only one that is remotely noteworthy is The Island of Dr. Moreau. But much like The Color of Night, it's mainly noteworthy because of its troubled production. What went on behind the camera made for a much more interesting story. The movie itself is just... bad. That's it. In any case, I can't say Striptease is a movie that's worth going out of your way to see. Like I said, it has its moments, but not enough for me to give it a recommendation. I would recommend checking out the book, however. It's basically the same story, but funnier and more coherent. So in conclusion, screw the movie, read the book. There's a bumper sticker for you. Next time, we are going to travel into the future of 2013. You heard me. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and stay away from other people's dryer lint. You sick bastards. Malcolm Moldowski, Congressman Dilbeck's right hand. You must be a very busy man.